We have two guests this week, and between the two of them, they've qualified for eight Bassmaster Classics in the last four years. Along that time, they've won two Bassmaster events. They've made 37 Bassmaster Top 10s and well over $1.5 million in earnings. And that's just in four years. This week, the Johnson brothers, Corey and Chris Johnson, join me on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks, humpers, you're all welcome here at the Awkward and Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Welcome into the 144th edition of this particular podcast, and I sure thank you for joining us here this week. So everybody, come on, gather around, throw another log in the fire, and let's let's all warm up together, because the last week has been as well and it's it's been frigid in most of Canada and really a big chunk of the United States of America has been getting um blistered with winter storms and uh, nasty nasty weather especially down south where they normally do not you deal with this kind of thing um so here's but here's the good news I mean enjoy your sledding enjoy what you're doing down south cuz it, it it's going to go away and it's going to be nice again for you guys. For those of us like me that are in the North Country, well, batten down the hatches. It has just begun. There's a lot, lot more snow coming before it gets better for us. But uh, I thank you all for tuning in. I hope you're all having a great and safe week. I had a big week last week um, right after this show went live, I was uh, on my way to Houston, Texas for um, to speak at a building that somebody like me has no business speaking at. I went and spoke at NASA, basically. I went and spoke at Space Center Houston as part of the Berkeley Labs Science Symposium. Um, it was a really, really cool event. Got to hang out with... Um, some people with uh, big letters beside their names and degrees and that sort of thing. And a lot of the fishing media world that was invited there and had a great time seeing them all. It was a really quick trip, but the whole excitement and everything was to introduce two brand new baits. The Berkeley Finisher and the Berkeley Credge. Two baits specifically designed to be used with forward-facing sonar. So incredible baits. Check them out. Um, and the cool thing is not only were they released last week, but they were also available last week. So quite often in fishing, something gets released and people are like, well, wait, I can't get it for another three months. Well, guess what? That is not the case with the Credge and the Finisher. Go check them out. Um, very, very cool baits. Uh, it was awesome seeing all the different media members from uh, the fishing world. It's always good to hang out with them. I feel like I didn't get a lot of time to spend with anyone, though, because it was such a, I mean, it was a quick trip for me. It wasn't supposed to be quite as quick, but due to weather, I ended up getting there late. It was supposed to get there first thing in the morning, but I ended up getting there not till like 2.30 in the morning. So got to the hotel 2.30 in the morning, slept for three hours, got up and did the event the next day, got back to my hotel room at midnight that night slept for three hours, then drove to the airport at 3.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I had to get up. 3.30, I had to get up. So, um, so yeah, I stayed in a hotel for two days and only stayed there for six hours. Didn't have a big chance to speak to everybody, but if I missed you, sorry. If I did get to hang out with you, thank you very much. I uh, enjoyed my time at that event. Um, met Funny story, met a dude. Um, I, I really wish I remembered his name. I told you I was in and out of there quick, and I, I don't remember his name. But um, years ago, when I first started emceeing for Bass, uh, the first time we ever went to Chickamauga, Lake Chickamauga, which I can say very, very well. Um, but when we first started going, myself and the anglers and everybody had a hard time with it. It was Chickamauga, Chickamauga, like many different pronunciations. And... Um, Somebody actually literally wrote a big article on me. Like, how can Dave Mercer say this wrong? How can he come to our town 
And how can he mispronounce this name? Now, it wasn't just me. It was all the anglers. But, hey, I'll, I'll take the shots. Well, so I'm at this media event, and this nice gentleman comes up to me and introduces himself to me, and he says, you're not going to believe this, but he says, do you remember when the first time bass came to Lake, Ch Lake Chickamauga? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I wrote an article, and right away I was like, you're. He said, yeah, yeah, I wrote an article about how bad you, you pronounced it. And he said, one of my career highlights was the next day after you read the article, I guess I went on stage and I lambasted him in the spoken word because he had lambasted me in the written word. But, man, um, I got to meet him, and he introduced himself to me, and I have to have respect for him because he was at least man enough to be like, yeah, I wrote that article. Could have totally lied. I never would have put two and two together, but it was great to meet him, and I hope um, this is another honor that I brought him up here. But um, that's always good to to have mistakes from yesteryear brought up, and uh, I thank him for that. Another guy I got to thank, obviously, uh, is last week's guest, Swindle. Once again, knocked it out of the park. Uh, I always say this, and you guys probably think it's just something I say, but whenever I have a guest on, I literally just say, hey, let's I reach out to them and say, want to do a show? And then we always have the same conversation. They'll be like, well, what do you want to talk about? And I'm like, I don't know. We'll talk about whatever happens to be what we talk about, whatever's on your mind. It's totally in control of the guest. Um, and with Swindle, it once again was that case. And, and the cool thing about Swindle is sometimes it, it is pure hilarity. Sometimes it is serious stuff. And sometimes it's just real stuff. And I think last week was just real stuff. And what I was so proud of in that show was in a world where everybody has to spew hate. That's just the way the world has gotten now. It, whether it be news headlines, whether it be uh, fishing podcasts, it's like if you put hate out there, it gets traffic. If you put something controversial out there that people will argue over, it gets traffic. When in the fishing world, listen, hey, there, is there things that could be better? Yes, there's things that could be better with everything. But ultimately, it is the fishing world. You guys love fishing. And I always say this show is is supposed to be a bit of a release from the real problems of the world. So I thank you guys for tuning in as much as you did last week. And I thank Gerald Swindle for having an incredibly positive and great outlook during that show. I mean, the world needs more of that and less of some, some other stuff. So thank you, Gerald. And thank you, fine folks for tuning in and um, and proving that, hey, you can have a show that gets a ton of traffic without getting in arguments with people. Um, now, this week, we bring two guests on that will take this show in a whole different direction, most likely. And they are two guys that I met literally when they were children, small children, uh, when their father was beating me in fishing tournaments and then they grew a little older and weren't even you know teenagers and they started beating myself and everybody else in Canada and then luckily moved down to the states just a few years ago didn't physically move there but moved down there for competition and the Johnson brothers what they have done in such a short period of time they've been on the elite series four years this is the beginning of their fifth season coming up they've qualified for the classic every year they have an unbelievable 37 top 10 finishes. Just think about that. $1.5 million in winnings between the two. It's unbelievable. If you look at their stats, I mean, we always give Corey a hard time, but if you look at it, so, so parallel. Literally, I think Corey has 19 top 10s and Chris has 18 top 10s. Corey has won an open and Chris has won an elite series event. They're separated by like 100 grand in winnings in total. But uh, what they've done is amazing. They are truly um, some of the best anglers on the Elite Series, truly some of the best anglers ever to come from Canada, and um, truly some of the best dudes that you get to hang out with. But, but here's the weird thing. There's part of me that I know during this conversation I'll be like, 
they are just geniuses when it comes to some stuff. And then there'll be other stuff where I'm like, we literally just grabbed two dudes off the rink from Letter Kenny and and sat them down here. Um, so Lord knows where this show is going to go, but I promise you it will be somewhere very, very good. So put another log in the fire, pour yourself your beverage of choice, and let's jump in the penalty box with Corey and Chris Johnston. Uh, Chris and Corey, looks like I've joined you guys at, at lunchtime. Just get off in yep. recess or what? <laughs> yeah, they let us out of school. <laughs> what What's for lunch today? I don't know, but it's really good. Corey's wife just brought it over to us. And what is it? It's fantastic. It's like a grilled cheese and chicken. Chicken, like grilled cheese. Barbecue wow. sauce on her. Pretty oh, good. looks good. Looks good. Yeah. What have you two been up to? Hortons. Trying to stay warm right now. It's uh, what? I don't know. Minus 15 out right now. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. No chance of bass fishing anytime soon up here. No, oh, she's hard. No, everything's nasty. This is the part when snow starts crunching, I want out. Like the, I'm okay with the gradual snow, but when you step on snow and it goes, that is the time to leave. And it's funny, everyone down south posting, oh, they got a little bit of snow right now. And I really don't feel bad for them because <laughs> we're wow. we're we're snowed in for the next three months. Yeah. Serves all those guys right that are down there pre-practicing in Texas. Yeah, <laughs> they got their mitts and toques on. <laughs> You you guys do not do that. You don't go down and pre-practice like that. No, not really. We got kids, and if you know, if got... I if I was in Cooper's shoes, one hundred percent, I would. He's got no kids, and he can go wherever he wants. And um, like kind of yeah, he's like, like a, a gypsy. gypsy yeah, yeah, sleeps in his truck, and he does it right, and good for him. But with us having kids, you got to spend time at home when you can. So. But you're not going to spend time at home. You're actually going fishing somewhere else. Tell me about that. But we're taking the kids. Yeah, we're taking yeah. the kids. We're leaving. We're flying out of here tomorrow. We're going to uh, kind of Gussie's neck of the woods, actually. Lake Winnipeg, a few hours from him. And uh, we're going to go fishing, ice fishing for walleyes. So get the rust off that way. We don't need to go pre-practice in Texas. That'll be our live scoping practice. Yeah. Everyone else does it from a boat. We get to yeah, live actually, scope through a hole. We got it right here. We're just getting it ready to roll. Oh wow! Table, oh. nice. So it's uh it's like minus forty up there right now though. So I don't know how I feel with that weather. And you're doing that for fun, like you're just. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I, when you're stuck fishing in nastiness and it's your job, but you guys are like, let's go have fun. What we're in Canada already. Where can we go colder in Canada? Yeah, you got that right. But yeah. we are going to do it in luxury. I'd love to say we're sitting out there in the middle of the ice fishing in minus 40 wind, but um, we're hooking up with a friend. They've got, uh, it's like an RV. They take it out on the ice. It's like 17 feet long and there's holes in the floor. They pre-drill it. So you're fishing in your t-shirt. <coughs> I'm also dying nice. of something. I've had this cold for about four weeks and it's about time to get rid of it. So we're going to go have fun. We won't be uh, braving the elements too much. People on the plane will be excited about that oh, cough. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I might get my own space in the aisle. <laughs> Everyone will get a new seat. So how, what's it, is this your fifth season you guys are going into on the elites? Or fourth? Sixth. Sixth? Yeah, Six. yeah fifths. Six, maybe. But 2019 was the first. I guess, yeah. Corey's not very good at math. Don't so okay. need to be. He's got to be able to count to five. How different do you think you guys are today than you were season one on the elites? We uh, we probably had more drive season one than we do now, like pre-practicing more. And um, I mean, now it's just show up, go practice and try and win a tournament. Chris, do you agree with that? Your drive has dwindled. Say, I wouldn't say more drive. But um, definitely a few priorities change just spending more time at yeah. home, which I think happens to a lot of uh, anglers as they get older and get families. You just can't be a Cooper Glant like we mentioned before. But I would say the drive's still there. Just have yeah, drive's still there. Just prepare, prepare differently. differently. Have everything ready um, the next three weeks, kind of packing and ready to go. And we're going to go down probably five days early to Texas and, and play with live scoping, different baits, different techniques on lakes that we can get on. And 
and then go from there. So make sure our boats are good to go, all the electronics, everything, because she's a little hard to put the boat in the water now, Dave. Even breaking the motors in, we got to go down early and do that. Are you, so you rig everything at home? Like your boats are in Canada now, you, you rig them and then bring them down? Yep. Yep. They're getting wrapped right now. And um, when we get back from ice fishing, we'll pick them up and uh, start getting ready. So I'm going to ask you guys to answer a question about each other because I think, I think I'll get a more likely honest answer, but, uh, and we'll start with you, Chris, what is one trait that Corey has that has allowed him to get to the top level in professional angling? Um, competitiveness for sure. Um, does his own thing and, uh, He's not going to let anyone else influence how he gets there. He's going to do it his own way. He doesn't really care what other people think. Um, but he's determined to get there, and he's going to do it his way. Can you give me an example of when he did it his own way and didn't really care what other people thought? <laughs> Which oh, time? Geez, yeah, hold it. <laughs> You're really trying to get the juice. I don't even know of one I'd have to think. Hmm. Well, Dave, you could probably give us examples, too. Hey, no, that's not what this show is. I just ask yeah. questions. I just, just ask questions. Up, eh? You guys give me the answer. If I say something, then you're like afterwards, you'd be like, why, why did you say that? But you're his brother. So you're allowed to say whatever you want. <laughs> oh, I don't even know. Just remember I'm within striking distance. Yeah. And also Chris, remember, he's going to have an opportunity to talk about you next. So just say, yeah, I'm honestly just trying to think of a good example. I don't know. I'm kind of stumped. I know there's been many, but come back to me on that one. Let me think on it. We'll see All what right. he has to say, and then I'll, I'll give you one. <laughs> Corey, what, what trait does your brother have that has allowed him to get to the top level in professional angling? I think he's more um, calm, cool, thinks about things a little bit more than I do, whereas I'm just like, you know, I just go do it. He's like more precise, more, um, I don't even know what the word would be, but he just – goes about things in a little more detail and depth than I would to get there. All right. That's, that's, I mean, that was a nice compliment. I'd say, yeah, I mean, that was good. so I can't so throw them under the bus too bad, but by the way, the sandwich is delicious. I wish I I mean, it looks it, it looks it. And, and it's Tim awesome. Hortons I mean, to wash it down. You're honest. like a Canadian <laughs> stereotype. She might be onto something, a grilled cheese with chicken on it. I don't think that's new. I've never had one before and it's awesome with barbecue sauce steak. Yeah, But um, I don't know. An example of Corey, maybe on the water. Um, he has a good buddy that fished elite series. Should I tell him that one on Gunnersville? He was sure. A good buddy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Corey's had an issue with another elite series angle. We won't even mention his name. Um, okay. On a previous tournament, um, Corey fished a spot for three days on day four. The other anger hadn't been there and he came right in on the spot just because there was a boat there. Anyways, had words and that and Chris was, it. was beside me and witnessed it all. Yeah, I wasn't far and I witnessed it and I laughed <laughs> and me and my marshal had a good laugh. We, I actually told my marshal, I'm like, I see this angler coming and it hasn't been there. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. This is going to get good. Watch this. Sure enough. Um, anyways, there was words on the water and that was it. And then Corey was fishing on Gunnersville. And he had a spot on a ledge, which, you know, it's like ledge fishing. There's only 20 spots. Everyone knows them. And this angler happened to be on one of the spots he wanted to fish. So normally if it was an angler that you had respect for, you'd pull up and say, hey, do you mind if I fish there? Are you already there? Won't even bother. Well, he decided, well, I'm fishing here. This is payback. I already had a good bag. Yeah, and he already had a good weight. So he said, well, I'm fishing here. This is going to be fun. So he pulled up right beside and, um, yeah, you uh, casted where he wanted on the spot. Let's just say that. And when uh, this angler said, Hey, I was here first. He said, yeah, well, this is payback. Maybe you'll remember it next time you try and pull in on me. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the, that's the type of stuff I'm talking about. How often does that happen in the elite series? And I don't mean with you guys specifically, but is, is that an everyday occurrence? Like, do you think that there's an interaction like that between two anglers, every day of competition, every tournament, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's an interaction like that all the time, but I mean, it definitely happens, you know, it, everyone, it's a pretty tight knit group of people, you know, there's only a hundred and whatever guys out there. And, um, you know, for the most part, I think everyone gets along pretty good, but at the end of the day, I mean, I'm there and everyone else is there to make a living for their family. And, 
um, you know, it's, it is what it is sometimes. Sometimes you, you know, you, you get into arguments with guys and, um, you know, it kind of is what it is. And I think for the most part, it just kind of stays on the water after that. That's what I was going to say. I think in the old days, people didn't really know all the spots like they do now. Now it's just kind of common knowledge that everyone has the same technology. Most people know the same spots and there's a lot of respect. And it usually happens at ledge fishing tournaments that if someone's on it, maybe you, you know them or they're nice. You just say, hey, do you mind if I fish there? And uh, if they say no, just to say, okay, but if I'm here tomorrow, it's the same thing. And uh, I think there's a lot of respect. And if there is a bit of an argument, I do think it's kind of like sports. It kind of gets left on the water and that's it. And you move on to the next tournament and there's no bad, bad blood. I don't, I don't find it's too bad really in the leads anymore. Has technology made that worse? You know, it seemed yes. like. Yeah, Corey, you agree? Because, yeah, a hundred percent. It, it has. Um, but again, I think before the technology, there was only so many guys like offshore fishing that really had it dialed in and yeah. you know like, actually knew the spot right and you know guys would be going by and like huh, i wonder what that guy's doing out there you know he caught him yesterday and they'd slide over but now it's you know it's so easy to go out and find all those fish in practice and um i i just think that you know guys truly found spots and um you know a lot of those spots aren't secrets anymore and you know, multiple guys are going to find them. So you just got to outfish the guy beside you, I guess now. And you, and you have a rotation. Um, now, instead of guys having two or three ledge spots, you have 20 and you know, okay, first four, I don't get on. You got to get on the fifth one. And um, yeah, it's just, it's more common knowledge. And back in the old days, you used to call guys uh, the road runner because there was only a few spots and uh, most people didn't know the ledge spots. And you'd be sitting on one and you'd see a boat go by and you'd hear the old beep beep. Like, and you just called them the roadrunner because they didn't know the spot, but they just, they waypointed you. But uh, I don't think that's as much of an issue anymore. Do you think forward facing sonar specifically has taken the advantage away from the Northern smallmouth expert? Cause previous to last year, I mean, you literally everybody, you know, you could write down a piece of paper, these guys, not that they'll win, but they're, they're going to have a good event. They're going to threaten for the top 10. And last year it looked a lot different in our Northern swing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's taken the advantage away, you know, and um, I think if you took live scope out of the Northern events, it would look 100% different than, than it would last year and the year before that and the year before that, you know, I, I think it would be, pretty interesting actually to see. i would i would like the live scope taken away from the northern events because it really hurts locals um because we'd have to go back to our roots where we used to fish in the kingston open and um had very good luck now side or live scopes come along someone can go out in the water and find spots that took 10 years for us to find they can find it in a matter of minutes with live scope and uh back in the old days we used to go out on like dead calm days on Lake, Lake Ontario, where you could see in the water down to 20 feet and you'd see those fish, you'd see the light spots. Now you can go out in a day that's four footers overcast and you can still find those spots even easier on live scope. So it's just made it way easier for people to find their spots and you don't really have any secrets left anymore. Do you think it's a realistic possibility that it, you said you'd love to see it taken away in the Northern events? Do you think that we're going to see any change in the future with live scope? I would think that like you're going to have to limit it or something because I mean, there's guys with, you know, five live scopes, you know, I, I think all you need is one. I don't think it's going to go away at all. It's yeah. It's here to stay. Just like yeah. things have come a long ways from 10 years ago, the side imaging, the mapping, everything's making it easier to find fish. And I'm okay with fishing with it. Don't get me wrong, but just on the small mouth, it makes it easier to find our spots that, um, that we've taken years to find. But when I go down to Alabama, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be easier for me to figure out um, yeah. some spots at the locals. So it, it works both ways, but I, I like using it. So um, yeah, the problem with, sword. yeah, the problem with it is, is these companies pour so much money into fishing, like, you know, how's bass or any of the other tournaments <clears throat> series going to say, you know, well, we're taking away live scope when, you know, that's a, a big chunk of Garmin, Lowrance, Hummingbird, you know? So I just, I can't really see them taking it away. 
Have you guys made any adjustments this year? Like with your setup, it does seem like there's a bit of an arms race going on with some anglers trying to put as many electronic devices on a boat as possible. Have you guys done any of that or is it the same as last season? Uh, we're probably going to upgrade a little bit this I have, year. I have two on my boat right now. I have a live scope, Garmin live scope and perspective on the front. And there's a chance by fork, there may be two more on the back. We'll see. Oh, there'll be a chance by Toledo or yeah, by Toledo. So I, it's, I don't know if the technology's there, you're crazy not to have it. Right. If So we'll see if I can get it on in time, there's a good chance I'll have it. What about bass breaks? What, what, this seems to be the latest thing. And, and literally I talked to Swindle about it in last week's podcast and I laughed the whole way through the segment because I heard about this last year from the crappie world yeah. and it, you know, it just, but now, like since talking about that, I've heard from more and more people that, yeah, no, we're going to see a bunch of that this year. You won't see one on my boat. It's a good idea. And I bet you it's just going to get more and more popular, just like power poles yeah. did back in the day. It was one and then two. I and just, I, I find like, you know, we have those, the power pole drift paddles and I've ran them for years. And, you know, when I'm going and I need to slow down, I just click my button and got it set to go halfway down. And it essentially stops you. So I don't, you know, that's kind of where, where my head goes with it. And then another thing for the technologies, Garmin has a transducer. I think it was designed for saltwater that shoots out 300 feet, 600 yeah. feet uh, at the front of your boat. And I know there's anglers that are running that and it makes a huge difference um, just like those breaks. But if you can see a fish at 200 feet out, instead of seeing it at 80 feet and then you drift up on the fish, you don't get a good cast in and he sees the boat. If you can see it at 200 feet out, all of a sudden you stop your boat, set up, make the cast, and that fish has no idea you're there, and you can present the bait so much better, and you never drift on them. So there's lots of technologies out there, to, and it just it keeps getting better. So I don't know where it'll end. We'll see. How much time in your off-season is spent investigating that kind of stuff, or is any? Is it literally just... You count. I mean, you guys work with Garmin. I know. So, you, you just count on them to tell you what's the latest, greatest, or do you guys spend a lot of time looking under Kaya Fujita's boat to see what he's doing? <laughs> Taking pictures. <laughs> I don't spend any time doing that, honestly. Um, and to yeah. be honest, Garmin doesn't really, um, other than the standard stuff that everyone has, they don't say, hey, try out this 300 foot um, um, transducer. And <laughs> to be honest, I wish they did. I just kind of, did some homework on it and it sounds pretty good. Maybe next year, try it. But uh, they really um, promote us to use the LVS 34, which everyone has. And I think that's kind of the popular one. And they want us to reach the, the mainstream consumers. And I think those other things are kind of niche markets and they don't promote us using it. That you guys have been on the elite series for a while now. Um, what is different about the elites like the outside of the weighing in the fish and the, you know what I mean? The crowds and stuff like that, but the actual competition, what is the difference between competing on the elites versus a Tuesday night tournament on rice Lake? It feels if, to me, it feels like um, going out and going from where we used to fish. You, uh, you, if you're playing hockey, you were in the beer leagues and then you just got called up to the NHL. It's just a whole different atmosphere as soon as you step out there, it's like, wow, you kind of made it. Um, you get that feel from the vibe from the crowd. And the, I mean, the competition is, I mean, it's the best of the best, you know, and um, doesn't really get any better, period. You know, and it's, that's where I've always wanted to be is compete with the best guys in the world. And I think that's what the elite series is. And I'm under the assumption I'd like to compete against the best and I'll take my lumps. And but it makes you want to get better. And if someone's dominating in the elites, then it just makes you want to get better and beat them. So I, I like where we are for sure and um, having fun. But I'm starting to feel like an old guy on the tour, to be honest. Never thought well, of that. It's happening quick. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's getting younger by the side. Like you guys were literally just approaching your prime, and then the prime dropped to yeah. a lot lower. Um, it's wild how young some of the guys that qualified uh, for the elite series are this year. Obviously we've got an 18 year old. I think the average age is like 24. So when you guys come back and compete and I don't even know if you'd call it compete, ruin people's summers really is what you do every single weekend. You compete in an event and 
really? like you know it's a big story oh, yeah. when i hear wow that the johnson brothers didn't win i mean hey we finally got rid of them yeah about time <laughs> Does it feel different competing in Canadian events? I mean, you have to have like your confidence, not that it ever wavered in Canadian events, but it has to be through the roof when you come back. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, um, I wouldn't say that it, it, it's through the roof. You know, um, we don't get to fish around here like we used to, you know, we're spend so much time on the road and, um, you know, when there's a tournament here and we're home, we'll go out, you know, maybe practice for a day, but most of the time it's just, you know, we jump in the Saturday tournament or the Sunday tournament. And, um, we've spent so much time on the core of the lakes and, and around here that you just, you know, what's going on. And, um, and I honestly, I love it. It's, it's where we grew up and it's, we're fishing against the people that we grew up with and, um you know it, it's just it's it's, it's not about winning it's anymore a camaraderie it's, too it's right fun. it's it's about going out having fun our kids are at the age now where you know they are pissed if we don't take them in the boat with us so um for them to come to the weigh-ins and you know be able to come practicing for the afternoon with us and you know just it's it's us doing what our dad did for us you know years ago so um it, it's different and it's fun being back here being able to do a few tournaments and uh and i honestly i look forward to it and to answer your question we're still just as competitive though yeah. that you don't like sit back at lunch and be like you know what yeah this tournament doesn't matter it's in our back pond or backyard it's no we're how do we fix something so we can win this and it's stressful um even though it's for three thousand dollars um, we fish as hard as we can all day and people see us we'll hit 80 spots we'll burn a tank of gas even though we've drove around the lake yeah. five times even um, if we're fishing for 100 bucks we'll burn 180 dollars in gas to, to win. win it it's <laughs> but, yeah, we're still just as competitive and we enjoy it um, just as much as we did when we were 18 so reverse engineer this for me okay yeah. sunday you both i mean if it been in the opportunity and the elites to win we don't need to go over what I mean, Chris, you've won. And so, uh, Corey, I tried not to make it like that, okay? Yeah, he he deserves it. He I gives it out. So, but having that opportunity to win and you're five fish away from it on the Elite Series and the Bassmaster Opens, how does that feel different than when you know you're going into the final day of a, of a big Canadian tournament? Does it feel different to you? Honestly, it, to me, it doesn't. You know, you're. it doesn't matter if you're fishing. To me, I mean... Yeah, the Bassmaster Classic, you're leading going into the last day. You know, that's like, you know, that's something a little different. But I just think of it as, you know what, I got to go catch five great big ones. You know, it doesn't matter what tournament I'm doing. You know, you just got to go out and do what you do. You know, it's you against the fish. And uh, it's, you know, just go out and do your thing. Do what you're good at. I don't care what you say. There's a difference between the Bassmaster Open and anything around here. I don't care what he says. There's there, there is, is more there pressure, is, but you can't tell open. me. You can't tell you me still that want you to try hard. No, you still want to win right. just as bad, but there's more pressure and there's more things that go through your mind on an open than fishing in your backyard. There's, an elite. No, are you saying an elite or an open? Elite or an no. open? Yeah. Any of them? No. Um, no, are you compared to Canada though? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, there's, there's, there's just more pressure, but you don't go about it any different. No, no, if there's just more pressure and you want to win more, and the paycheck's a lot bigger. Okay, Corey, let me just ask you, say, so let's go back to the St. Lawrence River when you had the trolling motor issues with the borrowed boat and everything. And for, I mean, I don't think I see that happen to you. Not that that wouldn't happen to you, but I think your reaction's a whole lot different if you're fishing for a Tuesday night tournament than everything 100%. you... Yeah, you're right. You're right there. You know, I was, yeah. I'd love to see the live footage that never, ever got aired from that. Yeah, but you you are right on that. There's, you know. If I there's not more pressure, Dave, maybe he needs to change his mindset so he can get a W on the elites. Oh. Just thinking out loud. <laughs> maybe he's not, he's not uh, hyping it up enough in his mind. Maybe not. Maybe that's why I can't win. Corey, do you look at the ages one to four as the good old days? Absolutely. 
for those of you who don't know, those were the years before yeah. Chris was born. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how fierce is the rivalry between you guys, or is it just all kind of shits and giggles and jokes? But like, how fierce, like when you're coming in and you caught him, are you hoping Chris caught him? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, you know, I want to beat him just as bad as he wants to beat me. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we work together and, you know, the, the better he does, you know, the more it benefits me. I, yeah, I would love to go number one and he's number two. And I think it's the same both ways. Um, but we want to beat each other just as bad <laughs> as anyone. Um, just, I hope he's just behind me. <laughs> what is the biggest, um, I mean, I'm sure before fishing the elite series, obviously you guys had success at FLW and what is the biggest difference that you've noticed? Like of something you went into it thinking, okay, it's gotta be this way. And the anglers are this, like, is it all exactly what you en envisioned or is it, is it any part stand out to you as very different? Uh, like you're talking as going into the elite series. Yeah, just to, I mean, you. I mean, I'm sure you had envisioned what the anglers you'd interact with, what the, you know what I mean, like personalities, different things like yeah. that. I mean, I, I didn't really know what to think to be honest with you, because like we never, other than you know, we fished some coasters and the FLW tour, and you got your you know your group of guys that you hang out with, and um, you know, I just I figured that that's what it'd be. You know, you you have your group of guys and you know, you all stay together and drink some beers and hang out. And I mean, it's, it's pretty close to what I envisioned, but um, you know, we, you meet some awesome people along the way, you make friends that you, you never ever thought that you would. And um, I think that's, that's probably the thing that happened the most that I didn't expect is, you know, meeting a bunch of new, new people and becoming good friends with them. And some of the old boys that you never thought you'd fish against too. Like right. growing up, you watched uh, Greg Hackney, flipping and We're that's getting, what we love you getting smoked by rick Klon. <laughs> oh yeah i got my yeah i got my <laughs> ass beat by rick Klon. what are the odds of that my first turn whenever but meeting those guys and getting to become friends with them and hearing some stories from them is that's pretty cool and that you never really thought about until you actually got there and um they're pretty good dudes and um they like to relax and have a beer with you and that's pretty nice you're right. Your first derby, you uh, finished second to Rick Klun. Did that make it easier? I mean, being like, well, it's Rick Klun. I feel okay. <laughs> no. no, I was like, you got to be kidding me. I should have caught one more bass because that's the way I'm programmed. It's like, I, if it was KVD, I'd still, it's pretty cool, but you still want to beat them. At the end of the day, they're, they're great anglers, but I, I want to win. And I'll never forget, though, that tournament getting smoked by Rick on the last day. I think he caught 35 pounds, two 10-pounders. I just, I shake my head at it every time I think about it, but good for him. The thing, thing that you guys went through, and, I, and I'm more talking to Elite Series pros, I feel like a lot of them go through it in a regional area. And it's like, it's just a horrible thing in fishing that if you're doing really good, like, you know, you've done really good when a bunch of people start calling you cheaters. But clearly nobody's calling you guys cheaters anymore. Is I, there a little bit? Uh, yeah. I, I just heard about it. Yeah. What? A new one. Wow. There's a new one. Yeah. Go ahead. Really? Who told us that? I the forget. Lindsay Bassmaster. Oh, something about the Lindsay Bassmaster. Some guy stood up and he was like, oh. I heard the new thing the Johnsons are doing to cheap yeah. on the St. Lawrence is they're putting GPS, uh, GPS trackers, trackers the on the fish so we can follow the schools of fish. <laughs> <laughs> you have got to be kidding me. That's a good one. That is a good I one. I don't know who thinks yeah. of those, but. Yeah. Because yeah. we're smart enough to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you did that, you'd probably be pretty stupid because it probably cost you more to do it than it yeah, would pay without, back in winnings. Without. I don't even think our whole Ministry of Natural Resources has the funding to do that, <laughs> let alone us in our backyard. Well, another good one I heard of was uh, we were stocking docks. Feeding, around, feeding docks, yeah. Feeding dock, fish under docks, and then we go catch them in the tournament. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, too. Does it feel good to have shot? I mean, I thought you shot them all up, but clearly not all of them. But I, I mean, no, but for the most part, we don't hear them yeah. anymore. I don't, don't even care. It just, it's comical. Did you care at that time? Was there a time when you were like, I can't believe, like, I mean, you worked hard to get to where you were, and now there's people that are, 
trying to throw you in the bus, did it bother you at the time or has it never? Uh, I mean, it didn't you? really bother me, but like it you know, made you, I, it a made couple, you want to win more. Like a couple times I'd like call people out in public and embarrass them. <laughs> but like it, I don't really care because I mean anyone that knows us knows, you know, we you know that's not us. But I will I'll make a point of if I know that someone like blatantly called us out or I'll, I'll you know wait till there's a bunch of people around and call them out on it. Well, it, yeah, I think does. he likes confrontation, Dave. If you haven't noticed, he does. He does. He does like confrontation. Is that the biggest difference, <laughs> difference between you guys? You you try to avoid confrontation and just as much as I do. You just don't hear about it. No, well, <laughs> maybe in hockey. But that was my job. How about Sturgeon Bay? What happened? Oh, that's yeah. That was ridiculous. I sat down the seat. I said, "Okay, Chris." <laughs> You deal with this. This is your but I, I tried to avoid it, but the guy was just being an asshole. But anyways, you want to hear that story, Dave? It, it, well, hell yeah. Content? This yeah. is I, I just so you know, this show is officially called Two Minutes in the Box with the Johnston brothers. Yeah, I like that. I like the that. way you guys are sitting there and chirping everybody. I, I love it. The 10 minute I was actually impressed. He gave himself a timeout. He sat in the chair and said, Okay, you deal with this. We're fishing in Sturgeon Bay, which um we're fishing a little sturgeon which there's 150 boats that fish i don't even know a couple acres and there's a spot called the cedars sometimes there's 50 boats on it so we pull into little sturgeon and uh it's probably about a 300 yard spot there's only four boats on it which is unbelievable that's tons of room so i pull in i'm driving and there's a boat going out towards the mouth of the bay so i just say okay i'll pull up near them and i went behind well buddy thought he was going to guard the whole cedar stretch which 40 boats fish this spot at times so i just i got the troll motor on high trying to get away from him and uh i cast out the front and he catches my line with a jerk bait and i'm trying to get away from this guy and avoid confrontation at that point i was like okay i'm gonna sit down and you deal with this yeah because the guy was being an ass and anyways so you get the old tug of war with a jerk bait and it's like right off the end of my rod. So I said, buddy, let your line out. I'll get it off. And what happened? <laughs> I so had to Chris, cut, no. So he's sitting down. So I reel it in. I got jerk bait. And I do not want to grab buddy's jerk bait when he's got it on his rod in case he pulls it. So I cut the line and I said, all right, come over here, get your jerk bait back. And he's sitting in the seat still, Corey. And buddy trolling was over. And he's like three feet from my boat. And I throw it on i meant to throw it on buddy's boat and it what did it bounce off his boat and I don't in the know, water long story short it went in the water <laughs> in the and water it was a sinking jerk bait. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd think it was a million dollar jerk bait because buddy lost it said i threw it in the water on purpose and i really didn't and I Corey was still keeping his cool i'll give him credit and uh finally buddy was losing he stands up on the front deck and long story short there's a lot of words said we'll meet you on the shore blah 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 and about an hour later, the tournament director comes out. This is the best part of it. <laughs> the tournament director comes out and he pulls up. And he's got like this big microphone. And he's like, team number 27, prepare to be boarded. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? So he like pulls up beside us. He's like, did you guys have an altercation? We're like, yep. With this guy over here, blah, blah, blah. He and said he's you, like, threw your, you threw his jerk bait in the water. I'm like, oh my God. It's a jerk bait. I got 20. I'll yeah. give you one. Give you the whole box. And it was just dumb, but uh, you I don't know. know. That, I, it was comical because there was a whole bunch of other people. I think Gus even went to see. Gus, he was, was laughing dying. in the background. And uh, it was it was funny. Yeah. Only happens to us, though. Corey, how, why in the world did you sit down? That is not like you. I was surprised, too. I had a timeout, Dave. <laughs> I think he just built up angler, anger as he sat there, though, and just. He stood up on the front deck and lost. Once it. the switch goes off, it goes off. So I just his one eye goes sideways. <laughs> Do you feel you're maturing, Corey? Well, my what? I'm maturing, what? maturing, maturing. <laughs> Is that the American way to say it? Maturing? No, it's just a word I say like different, just oh. piss people off, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, too. Yeah. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm calm until I'm not. He's not maturing, Greg, or Greg. Hey, Greg. Why did I call you Greg? Dave. Um, Thanks. Thanks, we, Dan. <laughs> we, uh, we play ball hockey in the summer for uh, exercise and have some fun. 
he just got his second lifetime ban this summer, so he's kicked out of that league. Oh, <laughs> so how do you think get a, he's first of all, how do you get a second lifetime ban? Yeah, because well, he had well, to write I'm a matured. letter the first time so he get back in. <laughs> do you See, think I'm, he wrote it? I'm, I matured until I didn't. Okay, so first lifetime ban. What happened? Uh, I don't know. Cross check someone. Yeah, not someone's tooth out. <laughs> um, but the so second get, one. So here, but how'd I'll you get back in between one. the first one and the second one? Like, well, I had to write like a dear John letter, right? Full scap piece of paper. Yeah, I'll never get written. And yeah. I matured. Yeah, I apologize. Anyway, so. <laughs> This year, first game of the season, Dave. First game of the season. <laughs> Paid his three hundred dollars. Yeah. to play for the year. Like literally, he's back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, but I'm a goal scorer, Dave. So let's let's back up. I am Naturally. a goal scorer. Uh, Chris will tell you I score way more goals than he does. So you guys can think whatever you want. I'm in front of the net. There's a loose ball. You know the ball was loose, and Chris can back me up. I get the ball. Goalie loses it. And he like shoves me, so I shove him back, and he throws a blocker and hits me, and I just like the eyes crossed, and yeah, this went on for ten minutes, a scrum of him trying to get out the goalie, refs trying to break it up. There was ten players on the ice, and like, okay, cool, it relax. And I said to him, I'm like, why don't you relax? You're gonna get kicked out. If you really want to get back at the goalie, go sit on the bench and come back out next shift when there's no refs. But he came and talked to him. It's like talking to a wall. But try anyways. Get, I tried to get him when we shook hands, and I guess that really did it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his second lifetime bang. But I'm getting old, day. Eh? My knees are sore. I just played four games of hockey the other day in some tournament, and uh, I'm hurting today. So, so during the handshake. Like the moment of peace in hockey, like you beat the crap out of each other, but at the very end, everybody lines up and shakes hands. That's when you went after the goalie again. I was, I was extra pissed at this guy. <laughs> we should video it for you, Dave. Really? I, I really, I oh. want that. That's what we need playing when you come in at the classic. Never mind hook sets and highlights. We, <laughs> we need you getting taken off the, goalie. the rink in cuffs. Yeah, yeah well, whatever. <laughs> I mean, usually if you push a goalie, the entire team turns on you. But when you actually fight them, how many of them tried to fight you? Not that many. There was actually one great big old boy. He had me from <laughs> he had me from behind, and I, I couldn't swing. <laughs> so I was like hitting him with my head, like like and he's like, "Ow!" Every time I do it, he's like, "Ow!" But like he, he had me by the by the arm, and it was a yeah, it was it was a good time. And Chris, did you just sit down like he did actually, in your battle? Uh, I, was on, I was on the floor, shaking my head and trying to like just break it up. Sure, you were. Grab a guy, and luckily, there's that guys on our team that stick up for him, and everyone would got grab a guy, trying to separate everyone, and he just wouldn't let go of the goalie. I and tried to climb over the back of the net, and the everything. Nets, the refs were in between. Just a mess, Steve. So out of that league again. Out of that league. Yeah, Man. maybe you can write another letter. <laughs> maybe he will it was the most expensive ball hockey game ever played $300 for one game he made an impact though people are still talking it. out yeah. of my I made, the, I made the two fans you know entertain <laughs> what do you guys do in the off season other than get kicked out of that, ball right hockey there. leagues that, that right there uh, them play hockey real hockey and then uh, deer season all fall yeah, kill deer do you spend much time? I mean, I remember last season, you guys for a little while there were all about training and getting ready. Has that been no, any of the uh, off season? Uh, no one trained Dave for anything. Are you talking like lifting weights? Well, I thought you one of you run once. One I time, I, went video. For a run. I went twice. Like, the only reason right? he went for a run is because we had a way off in his kitchen after about 47 beers and he was heavier than me. So he had to go for a run the next day. And I that did ended. feel shame. But. <laughs> One I run took care of that. I figured out a new way to lose weight, to be honest. I uh, had to go for my first colonoscopy checkup. And uh, since we're talking about weighing each other, I weighed myself before. If you go for one of those, I lost seven pounds in three days. So, wow. I'm going to lose weight. 
it's great approach. Not the most pleasurable. <laughs> I don't imagine so. I don't <laughs> imagine so. Um, so you when you when you leave a season, I mean, are you guys really this like we, the way you spell it out, it sounds like you just come home and drink, shoot things, and play hockey. And then when somebody says it's time to go back, you get in your boat and go back. Yeah. Go back to we, work. Like, we literally, like, like we're done. And, like, we don't look at our fish and stuff until January 1st. You think that puts you at a disadvantage? There's a bunch of dudes that have been, like, really pre preparing for this season. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> it's honestly it's it's a nice little break by the end of yeah. the season we finish up here fishing what end of september like a, yeah and I, then you know what our seasons are like it, it gets cold there's really nothing left to fish so um yeah we put the boats away and get into deer season so we don't really have the option of going out every once a week this time of year and going and practicing fishing like a yeah, lot of trying out new baits and you know making sure your boat's ready we don't have that option so you know it's do what we can do what we can and go play know. hockey yeah but yeah if we lived in alabama it would be a different story but we don't we just can't do it here you ever think of moving no yeah but i would love i would love to if it wasn't for family yeah. but it's not really an option we got we both have kids and stuff but i talk to cooper all the time he's over at the house and and we we always say like if you're smart you'll move down to tennessee or alabama or something and he still has an opportunity to do that and i i think one day you'll see him move down there to be honest sounds Crazy. like there's a little part of you guys that kind of idolizes cooper he's living the dream that used to be us it used to be us yeah he'll grow out of it <laughs> yeah so i think gussie might even move down to the states you never know yeah i mean so, he's talked about it You'd probably thought about it too. The cost of living, you'd be uh, so much better off. So yeah, the thing, but for me, home is home, and and I also think we travel so much that like it's not even for me. It's the fact that my family has family here. My family has friends here. Yeah. You know what I mean? To be like, hey, let's go, and then we're gonna get to wherever we move, and then I'm gonna be like, well, see you later. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Home is home, and uh, and obviously being what you guys are in this sport, there's a lot of good that comes with that too. Not just where you live and stuff, but I mean the, I think in some ways the sponsor world, you guys are a bit of an, like the, the goal is to set yourself aside, but you guys have set yourself aside just simply by being from Canada. Do you agree with that? For sure. I mean, 100% some of the sponsors have said, yeah. um, that's one of the reasons we can work with you and have the budget is because we touch both sides of the border. And you probably have the exact same thing. And you know, um, they can use two different budgets for us. And it definitely helps out. Yeah. And we're fishing a bunch of tournaments here that, you know, get publicized quite a bit. And, um, you know, we can help support our sponsors on this side of the border as much as we can on the other. What's, ne what's the next thing that you guys have to do in your career? Like, do you have a checkbox where you're like, we got to work on this? Yeah. Try and win a blue trophy. Maybe that'd be a good start. Anger of the year is Anger one of the year. Really Classic, don't get me wrong, I'd love it, but anger of the year, I feel like, um, would be my next thing if I had to choose one. I'll take any of the three, but now, Dave, <laughs> not going to be picky. Are you more motivated for angler of the year because it's literally the last box that hasn't been checked by? Well, there's nobody's won rookie of the year, obviously, so somebody could do that in the future. But for you guys, I mean, Gussie obviously won the classic. You were the first to win an elite, Chris. Is does Angler of the Year become more appealing to be the first Canadian to ever win Angler of the Year? I haven't even thought about yeah, it that way. That it's either. more so been from being close to it numerous times. Both of us have been so close, like that so close happened. multiple times, and uh, just hasn't happened. Like you know, I lost it by eight points the one year, and that was the year that I blew my motor up and had you know that catastrophe on the St. Lawrence River. So I just, I feel like we've both been closer to that one. So that makes you want it more. The yeah. class would be awesome, but I've never finished second or third or something numerous times. So that's why. I'm going to ask you for a moment of total honesty. And I don't think there's a wrong answer to this. I just want you to be honest. When Gussie won, sure, you were super happy for him, I'm sure. But was there a little party that was like, I wanted that uh, yeah. first? Uh, there always is, you know, yeah. like 
like I had a chance to beat him going into the last day. And, um, you know, I roll up to my starting spot and there's a local just warming it right up for me. So, you know, at the end of the day, if, you know, if I can't win or Chris can't win, I hope Gussie does, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, you'd love to have the prestige of being the first person. There's, I don't think anyone would say, um, otherwise. Did watching Gussie win change anything in your head? No, I mean, no, not at all. He's, uh, he's one of our good buddies and um you know as much as one of us would have loved to win it we we were just as happy for him to to be able to bring it home and uh be able to have some drinks with him after i'd love to see the the trophy come back to canada one more year too two years in a row whether it's gussie cooper or us it'd be pretty cool to see a canadian do it twice so and i don't think that's an unrealistic thought with the fishery we're going to what do you guys think no, there's a good chance it'll stay in Oklahoma, but not if we can have anything else to say about that. We'll see. Do you mean in, in Dry Creek, Oklahoma, specifically? Yeah, a good chance. I think someone <laughs> wants a little bit of redemption on that lake. Yeah. All right. You guys have a lot of great friends on tour, um, but I'm going to play the name game with you. I'm going to just give you names. You can tell me a story about them. Give me two words on them. Boy. Say next, whatever. And we'll, we'll start with an easy one, a guy that I know that you guys hang out with quite a bit, Lee Livesey. I knew that was going to be the first name. Uh, Lee is uh, Heat Man. So I'll let me back up here. Oh, I'm going to say the first the Marshall. That's it. I got to go for a second. The uh, he is the Marshall of Texas. There's no <laughs> about that. But. Uh, <laughs> first time that this we is the went first time to... in podcast history we've literally first... had a guest dying off camera yeah he's yeah he's a mess so we went to the bass meeting and i believe it was alabama and yeah. uh, we're all sitting around i don't know if you were there for this or not dave but uh we'd had way too many drinks we're all sitting around kind of meeting each other for the first time and um i said i don't even know how this got brought up but i was like I'll bet you, no, we got talking about wrestling. This is how the whole wrestling thing started. So we got talking about wrestling and Lee was going to beat me wrestling. I said, I'll do you one better. I said, I'll bet you that you can't even beat Chris in a wrestling match. And I was minding like, my own business he's like, having a drink. And I don't even know why I got brought into this. He's like, what? And so we all go into this room and there's like tables and chairs. So we're all like moving tables. We got chairs out of the way and there's a whole bunch of us in there. And Chris and Lee just get right after it in this room random room in the hotel at a bass meeting and uh you were probably there dave <laughs> so they get into this wrestling match and chris beats lee and everyone was all over lee and i think that's how this whole wrestling thing started and then matt robertson jumped in and he hasn't won yet about 47 and all he said he beat gussie 47 i should say he said he beat that gussie he it jumped was in a gussie top in a top golf, golf. <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat gussie beating gussie's like beating up the easter buddy you that's exactly what we said <laughs> oh. 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 i find his hacking off pudding <laughs> it's disgusting uh <laughs> seth fighter oh, god <laughs> he's making me gag <laughs> oh. You sure you don't want to come sit beside me on the plane tomorrow? Oh, I am That's so fine. glad we uh, – I mean, at one time I thought about having you guys come over here and do it in person. I am so glad we're doing this over Zoom. I I've lie. had this for about four weeks. It's not good. Seth Fodder, he's quiet, believe it or not. He doesn't say a whole lot. He's pretty quick-witted. Like, he's got a few good yeah. one-liners. Um just a, just a, just a, you know, good solid dude. John Cox. <laughs> he's someone I wish you could hang out with more. Yeah, he's a really funny, funny dude. He's a funny dude, man. I, I'll tell you what. I've heard some beauty stories about him. We're not going to get into him, but uh, you know, he doesn't drink, which you know you can't trust people that don't drink. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I was at a. Uh, mexican restaurant i forget who i was with but we were eating with cox and um just like 
the stuff that goes through Cox's head is like mind boggling how he thinks about stuff. And, uh, and I don't even mean fishing. Yeah. I was going to say not fishing, not fishing, right. just like life in general. He's uh he's an interesting dude. It's definitely that Tyler Ravet. Uh, soft. Soft. Yeah. Chris, you are really not contributing to this whole. No, I don't part. know. What, I don't know. He's all show. Yeah, all show. Push comes to shove. He's like a marshmallow. Wow. Soft as ten ply. Guns are for show. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Rick Clun scary <laughs> i think rick clun would be like a black belt martial art guy and i feel like he could he just is. jump up on a oh he is pick yeah, no, he really did him. train <laughs> <laughs> kick you right in the chin i think he could i think he could greg hackney weapon <laughs> we uh i drank a lot of beers and whiskey with greg last year and uh i think we're gonna get greg to come over to this side <laughs> of the border this year He's a lot of fun getting to relax and actually get to talk to him. And a funny story when he was having some drinks uh, in Clayton, I think it was Prosnick. And uh, he said, Greg, I'm going to put your rods away off the deck of your boat. And Pro- or Hack, he's like, no, I'll just leave them. He's like, no, I'll put them away so they don't get stolen. Puts them in a rod locker. The next day, he comes out and thinks all his rods were stolen. <laughs> Didn't figure it out for a couple of hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, and everyone, everyone in the whole hotel was laughing at him. Pretty funny. He looked everywhere but in the actual rod lock. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Matt Robertson. Oh, what you see is what you get. Yeah. He doesn't put on a show. Yeah. Um, that's That's him every day. He will tell you what he thinks. It don't matter where he is, who he's talking to you. You know, he could be talking to the Pope and, you know, it, it just, it don't matter with Matt. That's the truth. And on a side note, if he beats you in a tournament, there's a good chance he probably used some rusted old treble hooks that have been yeah. sitting in the bottom of his boat. It's just, yeah, it's a mess, but he gets the job done. Just goes to show you how good of a fisherman he actually is. Yeah. Is that frustrating to get beat by a dude who's using rusty treble hooks? You should see some of the hooks, like our smallmouth yeah. lures that you'd, you'd never throw in your life because it's so rusted and old, and he just puts it on and goes and catches fish. I think it's comical. I don't get frustrated. All right, I got a good one for you here, and I want you both to answer. Lynn Johnston. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, he's the whole reason we're doing this fishing yeah. thing and chasing this wild dream. Um, he uh, He got us started since we could walk. And uh, he was one of the best fishermen of his time here in Canada, which you don't really get recognized for um, him and Azumi and the Rocky Crawford and them. But uh, yeah, he was our mentor, mentor for this. Yeah, he, he definitely gave us the head start. And, you know, since him and I were young, 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 we were always, you know, we want to do it for a living. And he was, <coughs> said, you, know, you can't do it for a living. Like, who do you, who do you know? that can win tournaments and you know make a living at it and you know we you couldn't you couldn't name somebody that did it and we were so young I mean we didn't know anything about south of the border like bass or FLW or anything like that and um and then as we got older you know we got to learn more about the Costa series and um whatnot and uh there was one on the St. Lawrence River and we didn't know anything about it we literally knew nothing. We've never been on the St. Lawrence River. And Chris was like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, fish the St. Lawrence River. And I think you finished second. Yeah, it's like 18 years old. Yeah, finished second. And we're like, oh, this isn't that hard. And then Champlain, I think it was leading after two days, the next tournament. Yeah. Like, oh, so then my, then my old man was like, oh, we guess you guys are all right, you know. And can make some money. Can it. make a little money at it now. And um, I worked at Hydro One at the time and made made good money it's a really good job and uh i'm watching chris that first year go fish all these tournaments he won angler of the year and i was like well there's no way that i'm letting him do that and i'm gonna go you know (laughs) check a hydro meter like are you kidding me so um i guess that's kind of how it all started and one day i uh i applied for a leave of absence from hydro one to go 
and fish. And the guy was like, yeah, no problem. You know, it, it is what it is. Go fish. And after like two and a half weeks of being away, I get a termination letter in the mail where they never actually approved my leave of absence. So, uh, you know, I showed it to Lynn and he had some choice words for him. He's like, you know, F them, you know, <laughs> you're not working there no more. You're going to go fishing. And I was like, Oh, it's about time. Not too many quit people quit hydro as you know, Dave. <laughs> yeah it's a pretty good job <laughs> but um no but it was nice like he's done a lot for us and then when we were old enough um fishing when he was probably 18 i was 14 he could drive he kind of stepped back and let us pursue our dream when he still could have been fishing but he just kind of said you guys take the reins and uh i'm gonna stand back and watch and support us and he's still doing it and he'll come to a few tournaments in the states and uh he loves it and loves supporting us so and it was, we have a lot to be thankful. It was for always that. him that, you know, we just wanted to just go, like go and do it. Didn't matter, you know, how much money we had. And he's like, no, you're not going to do it until you can go fishing, not make a check all year. And you don't have to rely on that money. Like you can go fish, you know, do your thing. And if you suck really, really bad, you're not going to come home and be broke. You have to make enough money before you go do it so that you don't have to rely on strictly fishing if you suck and that's probably why it took us longer to join the tour than most people were like oh why don't you go fish the tour and it took us a few years to kind of save up that money because we had to pay forty five thousand cash and to save up that sum so you're not living off a of visa what do you what do you wish like if you could have given your got some advice or something what what's something you wish you knew earlier in this sport like how to invent live scope <laughs> good one <laughs> great one <laughs> uh, there's so many things looking back like that first term i fished on the st lawrence river my first time there i uh i just unlocked a little piece of the lake and if i had went around the corner i would have blew the doors off that term which i figured out the next year there's just so many little things looking back that I don't know. Now it just seems like easy knowledge, but learning, it just, it was a big learning curve. Back then you didn't have the knowledge, like the, the internet, like YouTube, where everyone does all this videos, you know, you had to actually go out and learn it for yourself. You know, if, if you had all that way back then, you know, it would, it would be a little different, but it'd be different for everyone else too. So, um, you know, it's, that's a hard one to answer. I do kind of wish we started fishing pro maybe a couple of years earlier. I think we could have, and um, we were good enough anglers, but it is what it is. I think we're doing just fine now. Yeah. How's your career going? It, 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 if you had to, you know, and let's just say elite series, but if you had to look on day one in the elites to today, have, has it worked out exactly how you expect it or better? Um, I mean, I, I'm a little pissed. I don't have a blue trophy, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I've been so close so many times. And, uh, you know, I, I I thought, and not not in a cocky way, but I thought, honestly, that I would have one by now. And, uh, you know, it, it just shows you that, you know, how hard the Elite Series truly is and how good the fishermen are. You know, like, we have, I don't know how many tournaments we've had on our home lake of Thousand Islands, and I can't win one. So it just goes to show you how good these guys actually are. Yeah. And like he said, with only like when we first started as 80 anglers, um, I think the competition is tougher than we thought to kind of close out a tournament. Um, yeah. It's not easy to catch them four days in a row. You know, all the other stuff we fish is, you know, back home or the coastas or the, you know, the opens it's three days. It's a lot easier to catch them for three days than it is for four. Yeah. So, you know, there's, it's uh, it's fun though. I I feel like on the elite series, the thing that people don't realize until they're there is the speed, and and I I think you see that in other sports where they're like it's just faster. But I I, I mean just the way that people adapt, the way that people change their, you know what I mean. In a regular tournament, you you get a lot longer to do something. It feels like it feels like oh, like just look at how quick people have adapted to. The smallmouth on the great, I mean, it wasn't like as soon as guys started going out to the lake. I mean, it was like one year and then a year later, they're all there. And yeah, uh, and they're all on good spots. <laughs> yeah. 
the, the anglers are just better and technology too, but it just, yeah, you got to fish by the seat of your pants and figure it out. And um, usually you have to figure a couple patterns now to win a tournament. You can't just win it off one thing. So you gotta, you gotta learn to adapt to win a tournament. I think. Let's talk quickly about the resource fish. I mean, one of the things that stands out to me being in all these U S lakes is I just feel like our lakes up here could be managed so much better. Like the, it, it really does feel like, I mean, Ontario has incredible fisheries, incredible hunting, incredible outdoors, but it's just because we have it. It's not when you see stuff that happens in places like Texas and all those places, it's, it's shocking. Yeah. Ours is like all natural. They don't touch a thing for our fisheries, right? There's no stocking, there's no nothing. And, um, and you're, you're hundred percent right. You know, I feel like our natural resources could do a way better job at um, managing managing it. Like take Lake Ontario, for example, you know, the, like Bruce Tufts, he's done all this research and blah, blah, blah out there. And um, he single-handedly made new laws for the lake, which, you know, personally, I totally disagree with these, these fish are, um, you know, he, he would go to a spot where he's done his research for year after year after year. And he'll see the fish, you know, slowly maybe move away less numbers year after year, but what he's not, he's not taking into account that these fish with the pressure, they just move. It's not that they're all gone or they're dying off. They move, they go somewhere else. It's like spawning fish. If you know, they're in a bay, and they get beat on year after year, well, they're not going to spawn there again. You know, they're going to go out deeper where guys aren't going to see them. They're going to move somewhere else. And I mean, I'm no biologist, but I feel like I've spent enough time out there and know enough about them that that's what I see. And um, I just wish that our natural resources would do something, you know, along those lines of maybe, you know, getting in touch with some tournament guys or, or people that spend enough time out there guides and work with them and, uh, and kind of go about it that way. Yeah. And it would also be cool. Um, maybe to do some stocking, like you see the programs that they have in Texas and your lake that you live on. I don't know. Did they try stocking the walleye back in that lake that got fished out? No, they, they've just put a moratorium. You can't fish for them. So it's naturally got to come back and, um, I don't know that it is, you know, yeah. I think there's a lot of other problems there. Like, I think the biggest problem with Scugog is I think the water drains at the worst time that, I mean, it feeds the whole Trent Severn waterway. And, and I did not even know this till I lived there at how, I mean, I think we way underestimate just how shallow walleye spawn. Like, I remember the first few times I went out with a flashlight at night, like just looking to see if you can see their eyes to see if they're spawning. And you're like, ah, oh, there's none out there. And then I looked like right at my feet and I'm like, there they are. Well, they spawn and then they suck all the water out and it's, and where they spawned is now dry. I think that's a big part of it. But I think, I mean, in general, I just look at all the New York lakes and everything. I mean, they have, they have catch release seasons. They have slot limits, things like that seem to make, like, look at what balsam's done with walleye. How, like, I mean, I think they've had that slot limit for 10 years and there might not be a better, for the lake to go catch a big walleye right now. I mean, some people don't like it for for eaters, but um, I think the majority of the resource is catch or release. And um, it's just, it seems weird. Like you look at that specific season you brought up, Corey. Okay, so they traded a few weeks earlier in the year that you can now fish catch and release on Lake Ontario, on the Ontario side. But they pushed it back and, and then they have it, you know, when you look at when our season opens, our seasons are dumb. Like they open when the fish is at its weakest. It's yeah. post spawn. Those you can catch those pre spawn fish for days and never affect them just because it's cold, yeah. Yeah. cold and. But um, and that's what I mean. It's it's people that that don't understand the what they're actually doing, and you know it's that's the frustrating part for me. And I think up where Gussie lives, they have a catch and release season first bass and it's thriving and yeah those are great and we could do the same here and just yeah. cut it off during the that part of don't the even year. cut it off i mean well, no during the spawn and stuff but still on the other hand you could even do slots in our area i don't like it probably because it would affect our bass fishing um, tournaments. tournaments yeah 
like you look at Rice Lake, um, it's getting so much pressure now, and there's so many smallmouth getting taken out of there that it's definitely tougher than what it was five years ago. And in another five years, it, um, I don't know how much um, that lake can support that pressure, but they might have to look at doing something there. Just look yeah. at the reasons. You, you go out in the fall, and it makes you absolutely sick because these people, they all they got to do is go on YouTube, and you can learn how to catch a smallmouth in the fall. And they see all these boats on certain areas and they, they come winter. and they come with the coolers and it doesn't matter if they're one pound or eight pounds, you know, the smallmouth are going in the cooler and getting taken out every single day in the fall. And I mean, it's only what the lake's 30 miles long. Not even if that, you know? it just, yeah. it is hard because every lake kind of is different. Then you go up North an hour North and it's a different fishery. It doesn't get the pressure. It doesn't need the same rules. So I don't know. I think pressure is the biggest problem, though. Like, I think that's what our seasons do. Like, if you think about it, so we have a closed season. And, and it, the majority of the people that make those decisions, like the majority of people that it affects, I think, like, we, you got to remove us. We're the outliers that fish an insane amount of time. And then you also got to remove the people, the 10% that don't fish at all. It's, it's about the 80% of people that do most of the fishing. The average family, if they fish 10 times a year, if we have an early season, if we have catch release season, it's not like they're not – now they're going to fish 25 times a year. Maybe there will be an adjustment period, but the average person is still going to fish 10 times a year. They're just yeah. not going to jam those 10 trips into a three-month window, and a part of it is when the fish are at their weakest, I think. But, I mean no, – Good point. No, I, I agree, and that's where, like I said, the pressure of, you know, everyone, as soon as the smallmouth season opens, you know, Lake Ontario, everyone is going to go catch them off of beds yeah and i mean yeah and i think new york's the same way actually on the st lawrence like they could open that up to a preseason and spread out some of that pressure and you're not going to hurt the fish when it's in may before the spawn yeah well i'm sure some smart people in the comments yeah, will tell say, us we're wrong. Get paid way more than us to do that sort of thing right <laughs> you said we're doing a good job though i didn't say that Okay, I have one last question for you, and then I'm going to allow you to go have some Robitussin or whatever. I had no idea you were so unhealthy for this podcast. I mean, when I said, hey, you want to do podcasts, you could have said, I'm hacking up a lung. Um, well, it's been like that for four weeks, so we may not get in for another year. The rate I'm going. All right, so this question, we started a new tradition on the show where you uh, answer a question, you get to ask the next guest a question without even knowing who the next guest is. So our last guest was Gerald Swindle. So he asked both of you guys a question without even knowing you guys were going to answer it. He just knew it was for our next guest. So his question is, what have you done to help make the sport better? Um, I think for us being from Canada, we have showed a lot of young Canadian anglers and anglers that, you know what, there is a chance for you to fish professionally. And not only in Canada, but different countries all over the world. Yeah, you can you say know, that, anywhere. but um we've opened up doors and there's a lot of canadians fishing opens now that you can make a career full-time out of fishing professionally and uh, represent your country um, in the states and do what you love it's a good answer Corey. you agree yeah 100 percent. that's what i would have said also also showing people that if you get knocked out of the league for a lifetime a lifetime ban is not always a lifetime ban if you write a nice no, letter you just no. need a letter you just need a letter apology letter which is no, why hey, probably better, wrote better to ask for forgiveness than permission isn't that what they say did you write the actual letter no dave i didn't write the letter <laughs> <laughs> come on do you think maybe if next time you write the letter you'll take your ban a little more serious i'll be honest with you That's i, good point, I am dude. not apologizing for what i did he deserved it <laughs> Yeah, but after all that, there wasn't even any punches thrown or anything. He just got banned. Like, if he was smart, he would have just went to the bench, minded his own business, and if he wanted to go run the goalie next shift, go do it. Don't <laughs> wait till there's no refs involved. But well, what the goalie get? Just PTS? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Goalies yeah. are in short demand, so you can't really <laughs> kick them out. That's true. That's true. The most popular dude on any team is the goalie. Oh, oh boy. Is. What's going on? <laughs> Look, he's got his ice fishing graph. <laughs> are, you, are you going ice fishing, Lynn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's coming. Ice in my drink. <laughs> 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 oh, 
All right. Well, um, yeah, okay. You got last thing you got to do. You got to ask a question to our next guest. What is I'll it? Let Chris ask it. I Any question, it. life, fishing, anything. Make them uncomfortable. Whatever you want. Um, if you weren't fishing, what would oh you be God. doing? That is the worst question huh? ever, Corey. Really? I mean, like, <laughs> when you get, like, the starter kit to start a podcast, it says, <laughs> ask your guests what they would do if they weren't doing what they're specifically doing. Come on, Chris. Is you can do better be going than going to another Elite Series angler, probably? Yeah. Yeah, most likely. Um, who is your least favorite angler to fish against? That'll make him awkward. That's a good question. You see, <laughs> yeah, there would you go. You, would you win in a wrestling match against Matt Robertson? Because it will happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you join the Elite Series, and you definitely are going to wrestle him at some point. <laughs> All right, boys, I won't keep any more of your time. I know you got a big ice fishing trip, and um, and a Horrible illness to get over, but I do thank you. For, stuff, I need so to go to a sunny state to get rid of this illness. Ah, wow! At least you had a good lunch. That looked good. It was delicious. The grilled cheese, chicken, chicken yeah. barbecue. It was good. His wife might be onto something. Looks good to me. All right. Thanks for well, having me. Nice. Appreciate it. Two minutes in the box with the Johnston brothers. <laughs> <laughs> See, ya. I like it. See. Ya. There you have it, Corey and Chris Johnston, the Johnston brothers. I thank them for being on this week's show. And boy, this show is uh, is an emotional roller coaster. You look at where we've gone just in this short year so far. I mean, week one, we had Rick Clun, so many nuggets of knowledge. Week two, we had Gerald Swindle, who, who just left us feeling positive. So much PMA, positive mental attitude. And then this week, we learned that well, <laughs> lifetime bans uh, may not be forever <laughs> with the Johnston brothers. Lord knows what we'll learn next week, but I sure hope you guys are here along with me to see where this show goes. As always, enjoy being, have a great week, and Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to, you hear?